we're going to be covering the infamous Moore's murders, which consisted of Ian Brady and Myra Henley as the killers. So this one leaves me feeling very, very ill, to be honest with you. It's probably one of the most disturbing cases out there. After the couple had dated for two years, Ian wanted to put Myra to the test. He began planning an extravagant bank heist, and he asked Myra to be his getaway driver. Myra blindly accepted the role and began taking driving lessons. She even joined the Cheadle Rifle Club and bought two firearms. Myra had passed his test. Even though they never carried out the heist, Ian knew she was completely loyal to him now, and she would even resort to violence for him. By June 1963, the couple moved into Myra's grandmother's house, and Ian began fantasizing about a different crime. Instead of a bank heist, Ian now wanted to indulge in in his supreme pleasure. Ian expressed his desire for murder, and Myra has always played along. So on July 12, 1963, 16-year-old Pauline Reed was on her way to a dance at Railway Workers Social Club in Gorton. She originally planned on heading there with three friends, but their parents had discovered that alcohol would be at the dance, so they weren't allowed to go. Pauline figured she would just go alone. Around 8 p.m., she got dressed in a pink party dress, white shoes, and a blue coat. Her mother, Joanne, brushed her daughter's hair and put a bright piece of jewelry around her neck. Pauline protested and said, but mom, it's your favorite necklace. Joanne said, well, you are my favorite girl. Sadly, these were the last words they shared together before Pauline left the house and headed down the street. That evening, Ian and Myra were on the prowl. Ian told Myra to drive around the neighborhood in a van that they had borrowed while Ian followed on his motorcycle. Whenever he spotted a potential victim on the sidewalk, he'd flash a light into the van to let Myra know. As they drove down Gordon Lane, Ian flashed his light, but Myra didn't stop. She recognized the potential victim, eight-year-old Marie Ruck, that lived near Myra's parents' house. So they kept driving and eventually they got to Froxmer Street where Ian spotted Pauline. Myra Myra recognized her since she was her little sister's friend and she offered her a lift. She figured the disappearance of a teenager wouldn't be as bad as an eight-year-old. So once Pauline got into the van, Myra told her she needed help finding an expensive glove she had lost in Saddleworth Moor. Pauline agreed to help. When they got to the moor, Ian pulled up behind them. Pauline shot him a glance, but Myra told her that he was her boyfriend and would help them search for the glove. According to Myra, she stayed behind in the van while Ian and Pauline headed into the moor. And about 30 minutes later, Ian returned alone. He quickly led Myra back to the spot where Pauline Pauline lay dying in the mud. Her clothes had been scattered along the ground, and her head was nearly decapitated by two massive cuts in her neck and a four-inch incision into her voice box. The collar of her coat and a throat chain had been pushed inside the wound. Myra asked if he had raped her, and he responded, Of course I did. Myra stayed with Pauline as she died, while Ian grabbed a nearby shovel he had hidden during a previous visit. Myra shut herself in the van while Ian buried the body. As for Ian's account, Myra was present during the attack and even participated in the sexual assault. By midnight, Pauline hadn't returned home, so her parents joined Joanne and Amos went out to look for her, but they found no trace of her. So by the morning, they called the police, but their search also led to a dead end. As far as anyone could tell, Pauline had simply vanished. As it turned out, Pauline had gone to school with Myra's little sister, Maureen, but the connection wasn't made until much later. During the search, Myra was often seen comforting Joanne about her daughter's disappearance. Meanwhile, Pauline's boyfriend at the time, David Smith, was also questioned. David had a criminal record of three minor crimes, but he was quickly cleared of any involvement with her disappearance. But this wouldn't be the last time David's involvement would come into play. Since Ian and Myra were now in the clear, they moved on to their next murder a few months later. On November 11, 1963, 12-year-old John Kilbride went to the movies with his friend John Ryan that afternoon. His mother Sheila had heard about the disappearance of Pauline, so she told John to be on the lookout for any bad men out in the neighborhood. Like plenty of others at the time, she didn't consider that John could have been abducted and lured by a woman. Again, the culture in the mid-1900s still didn't wrap their heads around the fact that women could be involved in murder and pedophilia, so many of the neighborhood children were only warned about suspicious men. By 5 o'clock that evening, the movie had ended, and the two boys walked out of the theater, and they decided to head over to the market at Ashton Underline to see if they could make money helping the stall holders pack up. Once they packed up the carpet dealer stall, John Ryan told John Kilbride he had to go home, and this was the last time that he saw his friend alive. Ian later came up to John Kilbride and offered him a ride home, telling him that his parents would be worried if he was out so late. To sweeten the deal, Ian also offered him a nice bottle of sherry, so John accepted. Once they got John inside Myra's Ford Anglia rental, they told John that they needed to make a little detour to pick up the bottle of sherry. John didn't think twice, but after they got the bottle, Ian mentioned another detour to go look for a lost glove by the moor, and just like before, Myra supposedly stayed behind in the car while Ian took John out into the moor. Ian then sexually assaulted John before pulling out a six-inch serrated blade. He tried to slit his throat, but John fought back, so Ian ended up strangling him to death with a shoelace. When John didn't come home for dinner, his parents Sheila and Patrick called the police, and for the second time that year, another search was conducted. Police and thousands of volunteers searched the area. 700 
900 statements were taken and 500 missing posters were put up. For eight days, 2,000 volunteers searched the waste yards and abandoned buildings near where he was last seen, but they came up with nothing. And once again, it looked like Myra and Ian were in the clear. They were depraved scavengers who blended into the working class neighborhood and gained the locals' trust. Six months later, they struck again. On June 16, 1964, 12-year-old Keith Bennett was heading to his grandmother's home to spend the night. Every Tuesday, he spent the night at her house, and this night was no different. Her house was only a mile away in long sight. His mother would watch him until he got over the crossing to Stockport Road, and then she headed to bingo night. Keith was alone for the rest of the walk until Myra approached him and asked if he would help her load a few boxes into her mini pickup. She promised she would then drive him the rest of the way to wherever he was headed. Meanwhile, Ian sat patiently inside the car. While Myra later drove Keith toward his grandmother's house, she said she needed to stop by a rest stop near the moor. Ian convinced Keith they needed to go look for a lost glove, and their usual plan was put into place. According to Myra, Ian led the victim out into the moor like always, while Myra supposedly stayed in the car. Ian took him to a gully beside a stream where he raped and strangled him to death. After the attack was over, Ian took a photograph of Keith's body, and about a half hour later, Ian returned to the car alone. His pants were spattered with dirt, and he held a shovel in his hand. When he got back into the car, Myra asked what had happened. By now, it should have been obvious to Myra, but Ian told her he had raped and murdered the boy by strangling him with a string. When Keith hadn't returned to his grandmother's house that evening, she just assumed that his mother hadn't sent him over for whatever reason. The family only realized something was wrong when Keith's grandmother stopped by the Bennett's house the next morning without Keith. His parents asked where he was, but Keith's grandmother thought he was with them. They quickly realized something was very wrong, and they immediately called the police. And Keith's stepfather, Jimmy Johnson, became a suspect and was actually taken in for questioning four different times over the next two years. Police even searched under the floorboards and found that the foundation connected to all the houses down the street, so each house was then searched. But as always, the search led to another dead end, and another child seemed to vanish from Manchester. In 1964, Myra, her grandmother, and Ian were rehoused. The post-war slum clearances in Manchester moved them to 16 Wardlebrook Avenue in Hattersley, Cheshire, 10 miles east of the Manchester city center. At their new place, they became friends with an 11-year-old girl down the street. Her name was Patricia Hodges, and the couple often took her out to the moor to collect peat and bring it back to feed their gardens. Even though Patricia fit the bill for a potential victim, Ian and Myra knew killing a child who only lived a few houses down from them would be stupid. Months passed before they harmed anyone else. But by Boxing Day 1964, they had found their fourth victim, 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey. Leslie Ann was a very sweet and well-behaved daughter. Her mother recalled that every day she would get up, make her bed, and help out with breakfast. She was dedicated to her schoolwork and popular with her friends. In her mother's words, she was never the sort to give anyone any cheek. On the afternoon of December 26, Myra took her grandmother over to her relative's house and left her there until the next day. Despite her grandmother begging, Myra refused to bring her back that night. Meanwhile, Leslie Ann went to the local fair in Ancoats, about 10 minutes from where she lived. Her two brothers and some of their friends joined her. They were only there for a short while before they were bored and out of money, and everyone headed home except for Leslie Ann. She decided to stay and have some fun by herself. She was last seen by a fellow classmate on a gravity wall ride. Not long after, Ian and Myra spotted Leslie Ann, young, impressionable, and all alone. So they purposely dropped some of their shopping bags near her and acted like it was an accident. And like the good-hearted person she was, Leslie Ann ran over to help. And the strangers asked her if she wouldn't mind helping them haul the bags to their car. Leslie Ann agreed and walked with them down the street. Once they forced her inside, they drove her back to their place on Wardlebrook Avenue. While inside the house, they undressed, gagged, and forcibly posed her for nude photographs and bondage. Then they raped and killed her, possibly by strangling her with a string. Myra claimed she had gone to draw a bath during it all, and when she returned, Leslie Ann was dead. But Ian claimed that Myra had helped rape and kill Leslie Ann. So by now, you're probably seeing this pattern of Myra is never there. Right. right. She's always in the car. She's out of the room whatever. But all the while during this attack on Leslie Ann, they actually made a 13 minute audio recording of the torture and murder, which even included, it was around Christmas time. And, and by the end of it, you can hear Christmas music playing in the background. During it, you can hear Myra's voice clear as day, barking orders at Leslie Ann. She would tell her to shut up. She threatened to hit her. If you're morbidly curious, there are transcripts online. As far as I could find, there's no audio recording of that. It's probably been destroyed. This audio recording was a huge piece of evidence later because Myra just constantly tried to minimize her involvement. And with this, we see her there and we see that she's totally complicit. At one point in this audio recording, we can hear someone leave, which we think is Myra leaving, maybe walking down some stairs, but then returning. All the while, you know, Leslie Ann is screaming. She just wants to go home to her mom. She's begging to be let go. You can 
still hear Myra ordering her to put the gag around her mouth. They had put some sort of scarf. They tied it kind of around her head and in her mouth. And uh, she's going to take off her clothes and everything. So this was a defining point in their murder spree because Myra is clearly complicit. She's tried to paint herself as just this unwilling accomplice who's just there. But she's involved. Yeah. Lights out, everybody. <laughs>